thanks for being here. If I vasovagal in the middle of this, go on without me. <laughs> um, so my name is Chris, for those who don't know me, I am uh, one of your PGY4s. Uh, so for my senior lecture today, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things that I learned about learning while being an EM resident. And I wanted to talk about this because I think like a lot of you, when I first came on to residency, I was feeling pretty overwhelmed by all the experiences that I was having. Um, you know, we work a lot, we see a lot, and we do a lot. Um, and while that's all really amazing, sometimes it's hard to see how that was all going to magically come together at the end uh, to make me, you know, the perfectly functioning ER doc that I wanted to be. Um, and certainly, I think part of this was that, you know, I wanted to uh, be reading more than I realistically had the energy to do. Um, and, you know, oftentimes, even if I tried to read, not very much of it was actually going into my head. Um, and even when I did feel like I had the energy and the drive and the passion to tackle the books, more often than not, I was faced with this just walls and walls and walls of text um, that really seem pretty insurmountable. This is non-medical if you actually read this, <laughs> just so you know, in case any of you were wondering. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing that I felt like medical texts were really good at doing were dumping a lot of facts on you without really giving you a good idea of how to apply them and how they're relevant to your practice. Um, so one thing I realized pretty early on was that not only was actually working as an EM resident going to be a lot of hard work, but learning how to become an EM physician was also going to be a lot of hard work. Um, I think over the past few years in residencies, I've thought of a few strategies that work for me and make it a little bit easier and even enjoyable. And hopefully um, by sharing it with some of you, um, you guys find it helpful as well. A few caveats, I totally realize I am speaking to a room full of super smart and really accomplished people. Um, and I'm not here to tell any of you that what you're currently doing is wrong. Um, this is just me kind of going through some of the, a very concrete example, hopefully of what I do. Um, and hopefully it might be helpful to you. Um, if anything, I hope it sparks some conversation among everyone about how we can all get better at learning, which is something that I don't think we think or talk too much about, uh, but is obviously, I think, anyone can really benefit from. Uh, so I want to start off with some basics of human memory. So as you guys are probably all familiar with, um, you know, uh, memory is divided into short-term memory and long-term memory. And long-term memory is divided into uh, two uh, further categories, explicit and implicit memory. And so the difference here is how much effort you have to exert to actually recall uh, information in each of these categories. So in implicit memory, that's things like your muscle memory, like using a pair of scissors. You don't really have to think about how to do it. You just go ahead and do it, right? Another example is emotional conditioning. So if I were to tell you that you won you know, $10 million in the lottery, you would immediately feel happy and overjoyed. You don't have to think about it and have to remember to feel happy about that situation, right? So that's your implicit memory. Um, the other category is explicit memory. And th these are things that you actually have to exert some energy and effort to actually do. And this is further uh, subdivided into episodic memory um, as well as semantic memory. So episodic memory, um, memories are those that you have personally lived through and have experienced with your own five senses and you can basically kind of time travel back to that memory to recall. Um, while semantic memory is much more abstract and is more like your generalized knowledge about the world. So an example of that would be knowing that the capital of the U.S. is, wa is Washington DC, uh, knowing that an apple is a fruit, that car carrots are a are vegetables and tomatoes are somewhere in between, right? It kind of depends on who you ask. Um, so these uh, two kinds of memory are uh, kind of interrelated. Um, but when we think about uh, medical learning at our stage, I think we're mostly talking about semantic memory. And that's because um, as young physicians, we're mostly reading from books, we're talking to our attendings, we're listening to lectures, we're um, taking in information without actually having seen it in real life uh, most of the time, right? Um, 
So that's really um, one area that I kind of wanted to think more about. Um, so the person who came up with the idea of semantic memory was a Canadian psychologist named Endel Tolving. And he did most of his work in the 1970s. His experiments really composed of uh, basically giving subjects lists of seemingly non-related words and objects, asking them to look at it, study it, and then after a certain amount of time, ask them to recall how, as many of those items as they could. And by looking at how much they recalled and the order in which they recalled them, he was able to tell us uh, a little bit about our semantic memory and how it worked. Um, so before I tell you those findings, I want you to try to take a uh, swipe of this yourself. So let's say Dr. Tolving gives you his grocery list one day um, consisting of these items. And he tells you that in two days, you need to go to the grocery store and get as many of these items as you can, but you don't actually get to bring the list with you, okay? So I want you to take a look at this list and I'll give you guys a couple of seconds um, and think about how you might go about accomplishing that task. Okay. Okay. So, and you don't have iPhones. Either. <laughs> I see you, Dr. Willis. <laughs> um, okay. So, uh, one technique is to basically just go through this as many times as you possibly can and it'd be a lot of time, right? Um, some of you guys might notice that it's also split between uh, two different columns in the page. So you might try to memorize those lists separately and remember which side of the page it was on. Um, and these are all uh, potential techniques that Dr. Tolving found people use. However, he found that people who were able to recall the most either unconsciously or consciously used a uh, technique called semantic clustering. And so this is where you basically group items in a list into uh, larger categories and remember the categories instead of the individual items, okay? And this is better for long-term memory, he found. Um, so looking at, at the first item in this list, uh, it's apples, right? And as I mentioned before, apples are fruits. If you, um, through the rest of the list, you see a few other fruits, bananas and oranges. And so under semantic clustering, you could put these two to put these three together under the category of fruit, right? So of course, when we say the word fruit, that uh, encompasses a very large number of different foods beyond the ones listed here, right? So in this case, you might need a better label. For me, I haven't really been to any hospital cafeteria that offers anything other than apples, bananas, and oranges. Um, and so over the years in med school and residency, I've come to associate them with a degree of sadness. Uh, <laughs> and so I might call this group the sad fruit, right? Um, and by recalling sad fruit, you might be able to recall these three uh, more specifically. So you can go through the rest of the list and do something similar. So olive oil and butter for me are cooking fats celery, carrots, and onions, uh, you might be aware is called a mirepoix, which is a, a combination of uh, like a base seasoning used in a lot of uh, Western dishes. Uh, turkey and chicken are poultry that we eat on a pretty daily basis. Um, and then tortilla chips, tomatoes, and cilantro, I would probably categorize as chips and salsa. Okay. So basically by having the shorter list, you're able to access the full list um, than what you than what we first started off with. So I think if you think about it, we are a very similar thing in medicine where you know we're given certain diagnoses, treatments, and we're basically supposed to associate uh, certain traits with them. So in this example for acute cholangitis, we have fever, jaundice, hypotension, CT scan, antibiotics, so on and so forth, right? And immediately you probably have already started categorizing these into groups. And I would say that most of you probably categorized it as such, right? So the signs of cholangitis are 
uh, right upper quadrant pain, fever, jaundice, altered mental status, and hypotension, the diagnostic tests, and then the treatment. Right? So this is kind of how we are taught to do this and how our textbooks and review books do this for us, right? Um, even though this is how it's commonly done, I would ask that it's not always the best way to do it in all situations. And uh, I wanna go over a few clustering techniques that I uh, kind of used um, in my studies. These aren't necessarily proven to be true or most effective, uh, but ones that I think kind of made more sense to my mind. So the first one is parallel structure. So this is actually a grammatical rule where that states that objects in a list should be of the same structure and type. Uh, an example of this is in this sentence, uh, I, like, I like soccer to run and playing basketball. So those, those three items are not parallel in terms of their structure, right? So to make it parallel, you should uh, change it to something like this. I like running, playing soccer, and playing basketball. So they all use that ing tense of the verbs. And similarly, you could, or you could also do, I like to run, play soccer, and play basketball. And that's all using the present tense. So you can apply this to medical clusters as well. Um, so in our initial cluster for the treatment of cholangitis, we had antibiotics, ERCP, and uh, cholecystostomy. And I would argue that you should split this up because antibiotics are some things that we give patients, right? While ERCP and PTC are things that we do to patients, um, kind of as surgeries. And so you can split these up into um, the medical treatment and the surgical treatments for cholangitis. Uh, another uh, kind of principle is elaboration, where you expand on an idea to make it more concrete and memorable to you. So uh, this cluster that we just made, antibiotics as a medical treatment for cholangitis, is really vague, right? This is true of hundreds and hundreds of diseases that we have to learn about in medicine. Um, and it also doesn't really tell you much about the specific antibiotics. You might be more specific and say that intestinal antibiotics are the treatment for cholangitis. Um, but again, when we're trying to order things at Epic, you can't write intestinal antibiotics and come up with anything. So one common regimen that you probably have picked up on during your shifts is ceftriaxone and flagell. So that is one combination, um, but there are in fact other single agent in intestinal antibiotics that are commonly used, um, including, oops, including zosin, cefoxetin, and unison. And all of these can be used as single agents. So you might actually have these two clusters instead. So ceftriaxone and flagell is one, and then the three individual items as a separate one. Uh, the next rule is the rule of three. And this is a concept that pops up quite a bit in our culture um, and is used a lot in communications and in advertising. And it basically draws on the idea that we as humans have kind of tiny brains and can only hold a certain number of ideas and concepts in our heads at a, at a time. Uh, in terms of like the actual numbers, uh, there are studies that say like four to seven. But uh, in advertising and communication, they really try to dumb it down for us and go with three. Um, and you see this a lot in our culture. For instance, like the Declaration of Independence says that we all have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, right? So that's a kind of like a famous trio. Um, in the three little pigs, you have a lazy, a normal, and a very hardworking pig who build their houses out of straw, sticks, and stones, respectively, right? So that very closely follows the rule of three. Um, a modern example, like in the wellness industry, um, you know, they're always telling us that we need to take care of our mind, body, and spirit, right? So those are all examples of this application. Um, so going back to our cluster, um, we have for cholangitis as the signs, right upper quadrant pain, fever, jaundice, altered mental status, and hypotension. And this violates the rule of three because there's actually five instead of three of them. And uh, in medical school, we actually learned how to split this up, right? So the way we're taught in medical school to split up these five signs were by charcot triad, which are the first three, and then Reynolds pentad, which despite its name is actually a triad because it just adds on two items to charcot triad. Okay. Uh, so in this way, you can make it follow the rule of three. 
uh, just as a side note, you can remember more items than just three using like different mnemonics and acronyms, uh, which I don't always like to do because it's a lot of effort and I don't ever remember them. But one I do remember is basal, um, which I use for the treatment for a hyper uh, for thyroid storm, it stands for beta blockers, antithyroid, steroids, iodine, lithium, which we don't use in practice, but it's just something that we'll keep in mind for boards and to make the mnemonic nice. <laughs> The last principle is realism. So the clusters uh, that we make and the ones and how we organize them need to be true to how we're gonna actually use them and encounter them in real life. So going back to our signs of cholangitis, uh, we last split them up into charco triad and renal pentad. I don't know about any of you guys, but I have never talked about charco triad or renal pentad on shift or really in any other setting besides uh, practice questions. And uh, as you go through your shifts, you might think about how can I reorganize this to fit my workflow, right? So you might reorganize it to uh, in this fashion. So fever and hypotension are the vital sign abnormalities, whereas ultramental status, pain, and jaundice are the exam findings. Because that's how we go about our day, our clinical shifts, right? We look at the vital signs, and we go see the patient and talk to them, and then eventually we move on to our exam. So one thing you might notice is that fever and hypotension pop up in a lot of diseases, and they're pretty common in sepsis, right? And a lot of diseases can cause sepsis. Uh, similarly, fever and right upper quadrant pain comes up more commonly in our day-to-day -day, uh, as a different clinical entity. Anyone can think of what that might be? Cholecystitis, yes. So it's much, cholecystitis is much more common than cholangitis. I've seen cholecystitis a bunch of times, cholangitis maybe once. So another way that you might form this cluster is in, to instead compare it to cholecystitis. So you could say that you could get rid of fever and hypotension and say that altered mental status, jaundice and sepsis are maybe signs that a patient has cholangitis instead of cholecystitis, right? And I think by remembering something like this, this is much more useful to us than the charco pentad and the renal, or charco, renal, whatever. <laughs> okay. uh, so that's semantic clustering. Obviously, when you just have a finite list like this, it's, it seems pretty simple. Um, but as we all know, medicine is a, a limitless universe of facts that are, is ever growing and ever changing. Um, and when I'm studying, I like to use a spreadsheet to kind of keep track of um, the kind of the clusters that I've made as I'm going through different material. Um, and I find that it does help me to, um, oh, and one function that I did kind of eventually build into the spreadsheet is to be able to search all the clusters and labels um, so I can quickly go back to things that I've done in the past and remember how I thought about them before. Um, so I really like this technique because it kind of forces me to be constantly be summarizing and comparing things that I did in the past um, and then reviewing and revisiting uh, information as well. Um, I will recognize one criticism though is that it may just be another wall of text I'm building, right? And at some point, I there were times where I definitely felt like that because when I would go back to look at the spreadsheet, I'm like, no, this is awful. Um, so reading a spreadsheet line by line is pretty bad and pretty boring, um, but I did find that I kept coming back to this, and that begs the question of why, and as I tried to answer that question for myself, I started to think about how maybe this is just one step in a broader process. So if you might recall from medical school, you might have been introduced to this concept of Kolb's learning cycle, and I'm not going to go into the details of it, but basically it just reminded me that there are many steps to learning that you know you might not really appreciate at first um, and they all play a role in this virtuous cycle essentially um, as an em resident i kind of reworked this and uh, came up with my own cycle that i think is more true to my life um, so and that cycle is application rest motivation and studying this makes a nice acronym uh, arms and so I'm gonna call this the arms of learning. Uh, so 
application, um, obviously the most prominent one is our day-to-day clinic -day clinical practice where we take what we read and learn from other people and apply them to our patients. But other, other applications include test taking, one area that I um, am passionate about is simulation. Um, but then even in just in day-to-day -day conversations with our colleagues when we're recalling cases that we've had, um, trying to um, get their opinions about things, we're, use, we're utilizing our knowledge that we've read and um, applying it to that conversation. Um, going back to our model of long-term memory, the application is episodic memory. So by engaging in clinical practice, by engaging in conversations with our colleagues, that's the specific personal experiences that we're building and the episodic memories that we're building. And as you guys probably have noticed in residency, once you've read about something and then you see it in real life, not only does that memory of that instance become more vivid, but also the book knowledge also becomes more solidified. And so that's how these uh, two arms of explicit memory kind of play off each other. Um, so obviously this can all be pretty exhausting. And one thing that I always have to remind myself is to rest. Um, so after all this application, you do need to uh, really disengage yourself physically and mentally completely and without guilt. Um, and I think this is some, something that we're good at, but often forget to do. Um, so that I incorporated the R just to remind myself. Um, next is motivation to try to reflect on uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing, uh, what I'm curious about, where I want to be in X number of years. And by reflecting on that, I can bring in more, more motivation to, be, um, to apply more and to learn more. And finally, as the studying, which is really what the rest of this um, lecture was about. And um, I, I came up with this acronym, not just to have like a nice, you know, acronym and uh, a cheesy picture with it. Uh, and also, I also don't think it should necess necessarily be applied very rigidly, like you shouldn't have a day for application and a day for motivation or whatever. Um, as we in the ER know, nice, uh, nicely packaged things usually end up more like this, bouncing back and forth. But it's really just to remind me of the different stages of learning and where I might be for a particular topic. Um, so in summary, um, I wanted you guys to hopefully take away to consider using clusters when you're studying, uh, use strategies like parallel structure, elaboration, rule of three, and realism. Look at studying as just one part of a broader learning process. Um, and if you would like, think about the arms of learning, application, rest, motivation, and studying. I want to thank all of you guys for taking the time to listen to me. Uh, thank Dr. Willis and Dr. Hassel for going over my presentation. Um, and really all my co-residents, faculty, nurses, and administration staff uh, for getting me through the last four years. I remember when I was a fourth year medical student, I thought I really want to train at the best and toughest program that I possibly could. Um, and along the way, sometimes I thought, <laughs> please, I don't want this to be tough anymore. <laughs> no more toughness. Um, but now at the opposite end of my fourth year, I can truly say that I feel pretty good about um, making it through Kings County uh, Emergency Medicine. And um, along the way, I've learned a lot of uh, episodic and semantic memories about medical conditions like constipation. Um, and I'll have also learned something about determination as well. And uh, of course, thank you to um, my class who are awesome. Um, and then next year, I'm going to be moving from the Big Apple to the Big Bean. <laughs> And even though we Midwestern County grads are a small contingent, <laughs> we do exist. And instead of flying over us all the time, I hope you'll take some time to visit us. That's all. <laughs>